Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by FanDuel's Jim Sonis, who's going to continue the conversation in regards to DFS this weekend, finding some under-the-radar players to put in our lineups. What's happening, Jim? Yeah, it's a tough week to find some value, Greg, so some difficult recommendations here for sure, uh, but we need all the value we can get. There are some injuries that could still break later in this week, so this can certainly change, but I think we have at least decent options, and we're going to need them if we want guys like Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, and Chris Carson, so let's start digging. How you doing? I'm feeling good, man. I was feeling good until I saw the quarterback that you were putting in your lineup. Because it's the return of Eli Manning, man. Under the radar, undervalued. Eli is back. He had a fantastic first half on Monday night against the Philadelphia Eagles. Can he do it for an entire game this week against the Dolphins, Jim? I don't know, but we can give it a shot. And I think the good thing for Eli Manning here is, I think the perception around Eli is that he doesn't take a lot of deep shots. And that's true, but he actually throws the ball further on a per attempt basis than Daniel Jones. His average depth of target this year is 7.6 yards, according to fantasyadhd.com, whereas Daniel Jones is at 7.5. So Eli Manning, gunslinger potentially? He is at home. He is facing the Dolphins. They rank dead last against the pass based on number fires metrics. And this is actually kind of a decently paced game as well because both teams do operate at a decently fast pace. I would keep an eye on the wind here because as of right now, the wind speeds are projected to be 14 miles per hour. It's a little bit higher than I would like, and I'm not overly eager to use Eli to begin with, but if you spend down at Eli for $6,800, it does give you the flexibility to get upside, upside elsewhere in your line. I think that is a good thing to consider here as well. I want to get up to guys like Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, Jared Goff when I can, but if you want to spend down a thousand dollars in savings, it's actually a pretty good amount to go down to Eli Manning. So yeah, the upside may not be that great, but he helps you get upside elsewhere. I think that is valuable on this slate. So he does throw it deep a little bit more than you would expect. And I think that uh, the efficiency should be pretty good here too, against his Dolphins team. So it's not fun. It's not something I want to do, but he's $6,800. You could do a lot worse at quarterback this week. Oh, he's a ringing endorsement, Jim. You could do a lot worse at quarterback. That's what brings Eli Manning into the fold. We'll see what he could do. Again, a great first half against Philly. Maybe a full game next week, this week. Well, who knows? Maybe? That was your answer, Jim. Maybe. But I have a better one for Philip Lindsay because it's an affirmative yes. He's facing off against the Kansas City Chiefs defense. It does allow points to running backs. And quite frankly, Lindsay's good and still undervalued and underpriced. Yeah, Philip Lindsay is good, and his role has been very good recently, too. They mentioned coming out of their bye week that they wanted to feature Philip Lindsay more often, and they have been true to their word. The snap rate hasn't always been there, but the usage has been. In that four-game sample, Lindsay is averaging 15.5 carries and 2.5 targets per game. You would like there to be more passing down work there. But I think the game plan against the Chiefs should be to try to keep things on the ground, try to keep Patrick Mahomes off the field, and that would lead to a lot of Philip Lindsay, who is just $6,400. He is facing a team that wants to encourage you to run the ball against them because they understand that running or that passing is more efficient than rushing. So they do this on purpose. This is not a fluke that the Chiefs allow a lot of rushing yards. They want you to do that, and I think the Broncos will likely be happy to oblige them in that and use Lindsay. And I think that that makes him in play at $6,400. The other thing here that I think is a factor for Lindsay is that Drew Locke being competent in his first two starts means that they should be able to run the ball deeper in the game. I don't expect the Broncos to win this game, and I don't expect them to keep it within a score. The spread here is nine and a half points. But if Drew Locke can keep this game competitive deeper into the game, that means we could have Lindsay out there long enough to do enough to pay off for DFS. And I think that's kind of the thought process here. You are not expecting Lindsay to get a lot of volume deep in the game. You're kind of hoping he pays off before that, before Patrick Mahomes and Tyree Kill are able to pull away here. So I think that Drew Locke being, you know, what he has been so far, which is very competent, is a good thing for Lindsay. It's a good thing for this entire offense. I think that it makes Lindsay in play at 6,400, even as a pretty big road underdog. Despite being a road underdog and game script not being in his favor, Phil Lindsay's usage, as you mentioned, has been really strong as of late. And the defense for the Kansas City Chiefs, not as strong against the run. I like Lindsay a lot this week, especially at this price. But if you want to go in a different direction than Lindsay, you still want to save money. We alluded to it on yesterday's program. It's Patrick Laird. He's in a good spot against the Giants. His usage was, was very, very high. His snap percentage compared to Miles Gaskin, very, very high. I, I think Patrick Laird is certainly someone to consider here on Sunday. 
Yeah, he really is. And I think the one concern you could have about Patrick Laird is his ceiling because this offense probably isn't going to score, you know, a bunch of touchdowns, and that does hurt his ceiling. But from a floor perspective, it's hard to do a whole lot better than Patrick Laird. He has $5,500, and what you get for that is a guy who was essentially a bell cow last week with Kalen Balage now being on injured reserve. In that game, 15 carries for Patrick Laird. He also had five targets. He had five targets the week before that, too, when Balage was still, at least in name, the starter for this team. So we can probably expect about five targets out of this guy in probably about 15 carries once again. If you get 15 carries and five targets out of a guy who is $5,500, you don't really need that much efficiency for them to pay off. So I think that the floor here for Patrick Laird is very good. The, Gi the Giants do great out well against the rush. They're ranked 11th there, and that doesn't even include the full time they've had Leonard Williams. But you don't care about that that much for Laird. You're kind of just looking for the passing game points and the potential for a touchdown, which he did get last week. So I think that if you're playing a tournament, it makes sense to not go here because you do want guys who have better ceilings in tournaments, maybe a guy like Philip Lindsay. But if you need to spend down and you're looking for floor, Patrick Laird is that guy that you want to target at $5,500. He kind of has the same discussion we had with Eli Manning, where, yeah, he individually doesn't have the best upside, but he helps get you upside elsewhere, and that in itself is valuable. So I don't think Patrick Laird is a must-use guy because the odds that he absolutely scorches you for not using him are not that high, but the floor is good. I think that is valuable. So Patrick Laird, definitely imperfections in his profile and such a bad offense, but still someone I'm willing to use at $5,500. And everything is great with Patrick Laird. He's not the perfect player by any means, but at this price, he is pretty close to it. It's not sexy. It's not exciting. I will say it is fun, though, because Patrick Laird is the real deal, and he's someone that, well, you want to save some money? Get him in your lineup. Up next, the wide receiver position. We go back to the Giants. We're going to stack Eli Manning and Sterling Shepard. What? Yeah, that's a fair response, Greg. I can't blame you, but we're recording this on Thursday. Don't have a lot of clarity on what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver situation will be. Brashad Perriman is crazy expensive anyway. So we're looking for value here, and we, we stumble upon a guy who I would expect to get 8 to 10 targets at just $5,900. And against the Dolphins, that's pretty interesting. That's Sterling Shepard, who is $5,900. He is at home, as mentioned, against the league's worst pass defense. That's kind of interesting. I think that the concern with Shepard is similar to Manning, where you don't really know what the upside is here because – He's topped 80 receiving yards just once this year, but you have to remember, too, that Shepard has dealt with a lot of injuries and has missed a lot of time as a result. So the sample here has been quite small. They played one game this year when Evan Engram was healthy and Golden Tate was healthy along with Shepard, and in that one game, Shepard had 10 total targets, and he had three deep targets or four deep targets in that game. That was with Daniel Jones starting, and I think that's worth considering, but you know, again, like you said, Eli Manning didn't look bad in that first half against the Eagles, and they're now back at home, and Eli's had an additional week to get warmed up here. So I think that Shepard's not that bad at $5,900. Again, I think that guys like Christian Kirk, who is not that much more expensive, Kirk is $6,100. I'd rather find the $200 to get up to him if I could. But if I need to save a little bit more, I think that Sterling Shepard does make sense at 59 even though the ceiling is not as high as you would hope here. I think you have to ask the question after what we saw Monday night. Why Sterling Shepard over Darius Slayton? Yeah, Darius Slayton's best games this year have come when they've been thinned out at wide receiver. Golden Tate not fully healthy for that game. Evan Ingram may now be back. And with Evan Ingram being back, it spreads out the targets more. Again, Slayton's biggest games this year have, been come, have come when two of their other three guys have been limited. So I think that Slayton's in play. But he's also $6,300. Christian Kirk is 61 and I'm going to take Christian Kirk straight up. Whereas Sterling Shepard is cheaper than uh, than Christian Kirk. So I think that I can jump down here, take the $400 savings and go with Sterling Shepard. But Darius Slayton is at least in play. I would just prefer Shepard because of the savings. All right, there you go. Sterling Shepard over Darius Slayton here this week. The Giants' uh, second uh, Giants wide receiving core, he's getting healthier. So Slayton should hopefully, if you're putting Shepard in your lineup, take a back seat there. Next up at wide receiver, I can't believe we're doing this. Uh, it's Greg Ward, because why not Greg Ward uh, when you are looking for value on this FanDuel slate? Philly is without Alshon Jeffrey, maybe without Nelson Aguilar. J.J. Ortega Whiteside is banged up. We don't know. Uh, Matt Collins is gone. Greg Ward, welcome to the squad. 
Yeah, if we're going to gush over a wide receiver turned quarterback in Ryan Tannehill, why not gush over a quarterback turned wide receiver in Greg Ward? And Ward is actually, you know, he got called up from the practice squad just three weeks ago. But in that first game, he had seven targets there. And then on Sunday or Monday night, after Alshon Jeffrey got hurt, we saw Greg Ward get nine targets in that game as well. So if you look at the two games where Alshon Jeffrey has been out or limited, Greg Ward actually had 17% of the team's targets in those two games, which is second on the team behind Zach Ertz. He actually has more than Dallas Goddard and more than J.J. Ortega-Whiteside in those two games, which is at least very interesting. I believe Jordan Matthews played in that first game as well. He is no longer with the team. They did call up Robert Davis in the practice squad, and Robert Davis, if you look at his top combine comparables over on number fire from the combine, his top combine comp was Julio Jones. But he was also on the practice squad for a reason. So I'm going to prefer Greg Ward here at $4,900. I don't think Ward's going to be some deep threat. He has just one deep target in his in his two games where he's been featured here. But he does have three red zone targets in that time. And they're facing Washington. Washington secondary is very much nothing to write home about. So I can take savings here with Greg Ward at $4,900. I feel better about assuring that he will be on the field getting targets than I do with guys like Scotty Miller and Justin Watson on the Buccaneers. And he has some athleticism. He did pop in that first game after he came in from the practice squad. So I like Ward a decent amount. I don't think you need to go here by any means. He's not a must-have in tournaments. But if you need those savings, and you will need those savings at times this week, I think that Greg Ward is actually a pretty palatable option. Basically, what Jim is saying is if you're absolutely desperate, you can do worse than Greg Ward. It's 2 o'clock. The bar is closing. You're looking around. There's Greg Ward. Okay. Let's move on to the tight end position, our final position here on today's show. And this one's an obvious one, right? That's Tyler Higby. Yesterday, Sean McVay says that Gerald Everett is not 100%, which means Higby continues to start and I assume excel in this Rams offense. He is, without question, you look at this list, the biggest no-brainer on it. Yeah, Tyler Higby's actually had a really fun role the past two weeks. It's not just the overall targets. He is getting a lot of overall targets. In the two games with Everett out, he has 26% of the team's targets. But he's also getting deep shots. Like, this dude's not that athletic, but he actually has 45% of the Rams' targets lead 16 yards downfield over the past two games. They have featured Robert Woods as, like, the short guy, but then Tyler Higby is their vertical threat. This is a very weird and very strange Rams offense, but it's working, so who are we to argue with what they're doing? Higby is $5,700, and yes, he has benefited from plus matchups each of the past two weeks, but Dallas is not a team that is prohibitive against tight ends. This is also a crazy fast game, as we discussed on yesterday's show, where I want to get access to it. And Higby gets me that at just $5,700. I think that's very attractive. I would also keep an eye here on the Panthers tight ends, because if Greg Olson can't go, Ian Thomas at 53 would be really attractive. Olson practiced on Wednesday, and if he goes, he's $4,900. So we could have other options at tight end in the value range with both the Panthers guys. I am willing to go there, too, but Higby gets me access to a great game that has a lot on line. I'm not going to argue with that when he has such a great role at $5,700. Really reasonably priced Tyler Higby is, and there are other tight ends. As you mentioned, the guys in Carolina, no matter who it is, uh, they're out there. There's some other options too. It's a good week actually for cheap-ish tight ends. So take a look around. But to me, the best option definitely remains to be Tyler Higby, as long as there's no Gerald Everett. That's going to do it for us here in the FanDuel. Hurry up, Jim. I appreciate the time and good luck this weekend. Yeah, go Giants, I guess. I don't know. We'll see how this goes. It's kind of a scary week for sure, but uh, it should be a fun one no matter how it goes. And hopefully we can talk to you again in a positive sense next week. Eli Manning, Sterling Shepard, Patrick Laird. We know where Jim's TV will be turned to. A terrible Giants team against a terrible Dolphins team. Fantasy football, people. This is what it's all about. For Jim Sonis, I'm Greg Sussman. Have a great night. Enjoy Thursday Night Football. And we'll be back tomorrow with Gabe Marenzi's best bets for Week 15.